And of course, Club Med is organized by a bunch of other <clears throat> centers around the world. And you can see that in the, <clears throat> in the chat there. And you can keep up with us um, by joining um, our listserv. I think you're automatically on it. You can opt out pretty easily, but I think you're going to be automatically on it. But we have a website and you can also tweet about this event uh, using the hashtag Club Med. Okay, did I leave anything out? I'm sort of rusty here, Becca. Is that about it? <laughs> I think you've nailed it. Okay. Um, we haven't run one of these for a while, and it's been a crazy semester, so uh, bear with me. Um, today, I'm really excited to introduce Lawrence Hurst. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence is a professor in evolutionary genetics uh, in the Department of Biology uh, at the University of Bath. He's also the director of the Milner Center for Evolution. Um, he's made many important contributions to evolutionary biology, especially contributions involving natural selection. Um, and, um, you know, of interest for us, it's implications for disease of various kinds. Uh, he's a member, he's a fellow of the Royal Society, fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. He has many, many awards and recognitions, <clears throat> including the Charles Darwin Award I saw on your CV uh, from the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, we're just really excited to have you here, Lawrence. Thank you so much for, for joining us, and I'll turn things over to you now. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. It's uh, a great honor to be joining you. I've uh, had evolutionary genomics and evolutionary medicine sort of out the corner of my eye for a long time, so it's a, uh, a real, real, um, real honor to be invited to, to address you guys. Um, join us in, so, at our conference. Please join us at our conference. <laughs> oh, well, may, may well do, may well do. Um, so what I want to talk about, what a lot of my research does is uh, actually very uh, medical oriented. So I, I'm interested in taking, uh, doing applied evolution generally. So if we understand evolution, can we use it to some good end? And in particular, those ends are medical ends. And let me give you a sort of very broad context to that. So being a classical evolutionary biologist, one of my key questions is when you're looking at something like the human genome, what are you looking at? And there's two conceptions of it. One is, and this is the view that most molecular biologists seem to take, um, is that you are looking at, this is the adaptationist perspective, of course, if we're going to use sort of Gould, Lewin's language, that this is a, a perfect machine. And it's so perfect that our job is simply to understand how the perfect machine is working. It's all there, it's all got a function, we just have to understand it. The alternative very much from the nearly neutral theory is that it is far from a perfect machine. Um, it's actually a load of rubbish, um, but, but it just about gets the job done. And so the nearly neutral model would say, well, our genome's full of transposable element, we can't get rid of transcripts we don't need, et cetera, et cetera. So these are two opposing worldviews on what the genome is actually like, and they're important. And they're important in the context of uh, not only evolution, but also in the context of medicine. Because when we're asking the question, is the genome this precisely engineered Swiss watch on the one side, or the Mickey Mouse watch on the other side, they both get the job done, of course. Um, we're really asking what is in the genome is functional and why, and that matters. Because if you actually want to understand and improve genetic diagnostics, we need to understand what is functional. Because if you don't understand what is functional, then you don't know which mutations could cause disease and which mutations to overlook. And we've often run under assumptions that we know the answer to this question, that if it changes the protein, it's likely to cause disease. If it doesn't change the protein, it likely won't cause the disease. I'm going to sort of challenge that today. So it's important to understand if we're trawling through paranosmia and trios trying to find which mutations cause disease, we need to understand what is functional, what is not, hence which mutations are going to be disruptive, which ones aren't. The other is that if we want to go in and actually make things better, we need not only to understand how genes work, we need to be able to understand how to rationally design better versions. So a good amount of my work looks at can I design a gene that uh, works? Most genes for gene therapy do not work if you just take them simply. But can we use evolution to understand um, what does work and what doesn't work? And what underpins my approach to both of these questions is evolution, because evolution leaves its fingerprints on how sequences evolve and tells you what is functional and tells you how genes evolve and how we would make a better transgene. And that sort of is uh, the, the short version, as it were, of the talk. So my, my work then examines how 
both gene expression and synonymous sites evolve uh, with a view to improving diagnostics and to improve uh, gene therapy. Um, well, uh, the bit I'm not going to tell you about today is um, the problem of the gene, ex the gene expression component. So what we know, for example, um, is that when you do gene therapy, one of the major problems is you insert a gene into the genome, often it won't express, sometimes it expresses inappropriately, and sometimes it modifies the gene next door. And we've been using evolution to try and work out, is there a safe place in the genome? So one of the things we just discovered just a few years ago is if you compare expression of genes, so all the human genes, you compare them to the, um, the inferred expression level in the mouse, sheep, mouse chimp common ancestor, you can then say how much each gene has changed its expression, its level in any given tissue. So here I'm showing you testes, for example. And on the x-axis, you see the expression change of the focal gene. So a positive value means it's gone up from common ancestor between us and chimps and humans. Negative means it's gone down. And on the y-axis, you see that the same, but for the neighboring genes. And what you can see is that the assumption that we've always made that genes are autonomous in their expression is evolutionarily absolute rubbish. <laughs> That's to say, if one's gone up, the neighbor's gone up. If the focal one's gone down, the neighbors have gone down. So genes are not autonomous in their expression. And we know this is a problem for gene therapy. Uh, and in fact, we know it's a big problem for gene therapy because the first gene therapy trials had to be stopped because the insertion of the transgene upregulated a neighbor gene, which caused cancer. So this non-autonomy is, is a key problem. So one of the things we're doing is trying to determine the evolutionary properties of genomic domains which show high and low autonomy. So are there genes that actually don't obey these rules that they change expression, but the neighbors don't change or the neighbors change and they don't change. What does that look like? That's the sort of thing, that's the sort of domain where a gene therapy sh gene should be inserted because they're immune to the neighbors. This allows us to define so-called safe harbors uh, and also allows us to determine what are the best vectors for inserting the new genes in. And I'll give you a very quick version of that. The answer isn't AAVs, which is what everybody uses at the moment. It's Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping Beauty is rather lovely in this regard. Um, uh, but anyway, watch this space. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. What I am going to talk about in this talk, however, is the related work, which is um, looking at how synonymous sites uh, evolve with a view to both improving diagnostics that say which synonymous mutations might cause disease, understanding better the etiology of a disease. So if you understand what causes it, you can understand what the not downstream consequences are. And then in turn, and I think this is possibly some of the most exciting stuff we're doing at the moment, can we actually employ evolution to work out how to make really effective transgenes for gene therapy? Because um, for gene therapy, we're allowed to change the synonymous sites of a gene but we're not allowed to change the protein of the gene. So it all has to be about the synonymous sites. Anyway, before I go any further, just in case there aren't any geneticists on, in the audience or uh, members for whom the genetics is such a distant memory that they need a reminder. So here's a few very unnecessary reminders, I'm sure. Uh, so I do apologize for uh, um, appearing a little bit patronizing here, but just in case anybody didn't know what a synonymous mutation is, so the genetic code, of course, is uh, triplets, uh, which gives us 64 codons, 61 of those are coding, three are stop codons, so, but we've only got 20 amino acids, and so 18 of the amino acids have more than one codon, and it's these 18 that define so-called synonymous mutations. So a synonymous mutation is any mutation which changes a codon, but doesn't change the amino acid. So just in case anybody wasn't clear what I'm talking about, so here's an example. Glycine is coded by GGN, so it doesn't matter what the third side is. So a mutation GGC to GGT would be a synonymous mutation, and that third site we would call a synonymous site. Synonym means the same thing, same amino acids. And as I said, for, G, for, for both biotech and for making transgenes, it's these sites that we can change. So uh, that's why we're particularly interested in them, uh, amongst other reasons. And so for RNA vaccines, for gene therapy, we're allowed to modify the synonymous sites. The question is, what's the point and what's the best way of doing it? And obviously the most obvious question is if these things are quite silent. So if you go back to King and Jukes back in the what, early 70s, late 60s, uh, they simply asserted that synonymous mutations are silent. But, and they couldn't see any reason why they would not be, by which they meant they have no fitness consequences. 
Um, so if they have no fitness consequences, then why would changing them have any effects whatsoever? So let me start this talk by showing you how, particularly in mammals and particularly in humans, turns out we are unusual here, um, we are very odd in this regard, that our synonymous mutations can be under very strong selection. And let me explain to you the mechanism why, because if you know anything about selection on synonymous mutations, this is not the mechanism that most people think. Most people think it's all about ad adaptation to tRNA pools. No, not in humans at all. So let me start by presenting uh, what you might regard as the paradigmatic example now that we've been working on for a few years uh, of selection on synonymous sites. And it comes down to this problem. Our genes are unusually rich in introns. So the exons are the coding bits, multiple codons, starting HG, ending with a stop, but we have to get rid of the introns. Um, and so, of course, uh, if you look at a textbook, they always show you these lovely pictures of an exon in gray and then an intron in black, and then this amazing splicing process happens and they get joined together. Um, but of course, these are just, it's all just nucleotides. This is just RNA. So the, the obvious question is, how on earth does our cell uh, actually recognize where an exon intron junction complex actually is to make sure we splice properly and glue together the right bits, as it were? And it turns out that synonymous sites are really important in this. That's the, that's the short version. So if you look at an old textbook version of how this is done, you see really complicated confusograms like this. The important thing to note about that, this is, comes from yeast uh, predominantly. And what you see is most of the bindings, so here now the introns are in uh, yellow and the exons, the bits we want, are in blue. Um, most of the binding is either right at the splice site, like the U1 SNRP, for example, or it's within the intron. And that's the canonical version of how splicing happens. It's not what happens in humans. In humans, this is much better a model of how splicing actually happens. And the stars, the heroes of this particular story are these things. So ESEs, that stands for exonic splice enhancers. These are short motifs, six nucleotides long or so. And what they do is they bind a group of serine arginine rich proteins. Those are SR, arginine is R, so hence SR proteins. And the binding of an SR protein to an ESE tells the system where an exon intron junction is likely to be. So ESEs are enriched towards exon ends. And the SR protein then binding says there must be an exon junction somewhere around here, and that recruits the machinery but only recruits in the vicinity of exon intron junctions. So these proteins, as I said, these ECs are about six nucleotides long. What's important though, is that they function in a dosage dependent fashion. The more you have, the more likely an SR protein will bind, the more likely it is that you'll get accurate splicing. We know that from um, a number of experiments, but they have a number of very odd properties. So first off, yeah, they have to be enriched near exon intron boundaries, and that is indeed the case. But notice here what we mean by an exon intron boundary. These things function up to about 70 nucleotides away from the end of an exon. But the average exon size in humans is less than 140 base pairs. So the average exon is all exon end, according to an ESE and according to SR proteins. So our exons are unusually, are unusually small and unusually compact. They also have a very strange nucleotide content. They are, of the ESEs that we know, we've got a catalog of about 200, 300 well-described ESEs. Um, they are very, very A-rich, and if they're not A, they're G, so they're very purine-rich. 50% of the nucleotides in the well-described ESEs are A, another 25% are G, and so they're very, very purine-rich, very skewed nucleotide content. Um, and the first indication that this might be what's going on with selection on synonymous sites comes when you look at SNP density. So how common is a SNP circulating within the human population? SNPs, it turns out, are rare at the ends of exons. So we're actually all most related to each other at the ends of our exons, because we think SNPs that hit ESEs, and I'll show you some evidence for this, SNPs that hit ESEs disturb splicing, and disturb splicing is bad news. So anyway, this is another way to think about our exons. Our exons particularly our short ones, are basically flypaper for SR proteins. So the uh, ESEs, in some exons, all sequence within an exon is in fact SR protein binding domain. More normal sort of numbers are 30 to 40% of all nucleosides towards the ends of our exons 
are actually uh, sticky for SR proteins. So our exons you have to think of as being like flypaper for SR proteins, but important component of that flypaper are the third, the synonymous sites. So an ESE spanning six nucleotides doesn't know whether it's spanning a synonymous site or a non-synonymous site. It just needs to know I have to bind here. Um, and so a few years ago, um, we had a funny, this paper had a very funny reception because what you're seeing here is uh, a result that made us fall off our chairs because everybody had said, all the textbooks say, there is no selection on some of sites in humans. And we thought, well, what's going on in ESEs? So we masked out ESEs and we masked out non-ESE. And when you compare the rates of evolution at synonymous sites between the two, the effect isn't even subtle. So the ESEs evolve about at synonymous sites, those synonymous sites evolve a third of the rate of um, sites equally distant, that's what you see on the x-axis, from an exon in Chong junction uh, that aren't ESE. So our ESEs are just, they're sticky uh, for SR proteins and they're conserved to be sticky and that conservation involves selection on synonymous sites. And we estimate that this causes about a 20% reduction in uh, the number of mutations that you observe because we don't observe them because the SNPs fall out of the population because they're under purifying selection. So it's not, not even subtle. And I said this had an interesting um, consequence. The journal editor, the, the reviewers could find nothing wrong. They also did extremely interesting, but the journal editor simply said, it is well known that there is no selection on synonymous sites, therefore I'm rejecting the paper. Anyway, we argued and we got it published. So, and it's now, everybody's replicated this particular result. So yes, it is true. And it has our interesting other results that we can explain why exons differ in their apparent rate of synonymous evolution. Big exons evolve faster because less is towards the exon end. Duh, yeah, pretty obvious. Small exons and all exon ends, so they evolve slower. Um, it can also explain rather beautifully trends in codon usage. So, each codon has a propensity to be in an ESE. As I said, they tend to be very A-rich. Um, and so it turns out the stickiest of the stickiest of codons is in fact GAA. And what you're comparing here is GAA ultra sticky to SR proteins to GAG, which is actually also pretty sticky, but it's not as sticky as GAA. And as you go towards the end of exons, although they specify the same amino acids, GAA is preferred in humans. And again, it's not even a subtle effect, it's, it's very obvious. And we devise then a general uh, measure of the extent to which we think a codon is sticky, the extent to which it's preferred in ESEs, that is, which is its usage minus that of uh, random hexamas derived from the human genome. So it's just a Z score. We called it rather pompously the hexama preference index, but it's just a Z score of how much a, a given codon is uh, used. And it turns out that, um, and this is what this shows, is that the, the stickier, the more likely that um, uh, uh, codon features in an ESE, the more likely it is enriched towards the ends of exon ends. That's what this slope on the x-axis is telling you. It's that slope that we saw before. So if it's a positive slope, it's really liked to, uh, uh, sorry, negative slope, it's really liked towards exon ends, given the way we're plotting it. M m uh, for all, the, so what you're seeing is all the pairwise comparisons between codons, and generally the codon that is stickier is the one preferred at exon ends, and the more, the greater the difference in stickiness, the greater it's preferred at, towards exon ends. So it makes beautiful count of a funny little feature, which is codon usage changes as you move towards exon ends. So really all you're seeing is that our genes are loaded up with not only information as to what the protein is, but they're loaded up with information for how to make the protein as well, how to splice the transcript to make the protein. Um, and one thing to emphasize, particularly in the context of human medicine, is that our genes are unusual. So this is a plot for a certain number of organisms. And what you see on the x-axis here is how, long, how big the intron-free version is, so after we got rid of the introns, divided by the length of genes. So ours are short coding sequences, but massive genes. So we end up with only 18% or so of um, a gene is actually coding. Whereas if you go and look at the yeast, it's much more like almost 100%. But as you can see, there's an overall a general trend. I've just shown you some of the, 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 the model organisms on here, but humans are actually at sort of one end of this distribution. So we have very small exons compared to the size, overall size of the genes. And on, on the y-axis is how much do we 
then have selection on ESEs or overrepresentation of ESEs or whatever. Uh, and then, so we are using uh, a lot of ESEs at the ends of our exons because our exons are tiny little bits of useful information in a sea of intronic rubbish. So we're flagging up, we're using the ESEs to flag up where our exons actually sit. And this fits into a more general context because we think the problem that we have is that large introns are a pain. Um, large introns are particularly difficult to get, get spliced accurately. So we know experimentally, if you just take a gene, one of our genes, and you put in extra rubbish information, doesn't matter what it is, um, and it doesn't matter where you put it into the intron, just simply making them bigger makes them splice less accurately. And this is because we have a problem recognizing where our splice junctions are. Likewise, uh, if you look at from the transcriptomic data sets and you ask which, which, which exons appear to sometimes appear and sometimes not appear, those are the ones flanked by large uh, introns. And if you look over evolutionary time and you ask which exons sort of appear in one species but we can't find them in the neighbors, those tend to be ones flanked by large introns as well. So large introns we think are a problem. They're very, very difficult to make sure that the intron next to them are spliced properly. And we cope with this um, very nicely by building in not only lots of ESEs, we have more ESEs if the flanking intron is bigger. So that's what this show says. So if the flanking intron is very large, then we have a higher density of ESEs uh, in the flanking exon. Which makes sense. If you if you're a tiny island, a very big sea of rubbish, you put the you put the fire on the tiny island to say this is where the tiny island is. Um, if you're a big island and the flanking bits are tiny, then you go, well, I can find it. It's not a problem. Um, so this then led us to the problem of disease causing mutations because uh, we've got strong evidence that synonymous sites then are under selection because. They are necessary to preserve the stickiness of exons to enable them to be spliced properly. And we had prior evidence that a good number of synonymous mutations do cause disease and they do it by disrupting ESEs and therefore causing misplicing. We have a catalog of these now and it's up to a couple of, couple of hundred uh, disease causing mutations which seem to be bona fide ones as it were. But we looked and asked much more generally, um, how important is this? And so, um, what we could do is ask where are disease causing mutations in exons? So if we take the ClinVar database, so this is a data set of well-described mutations that cause disease. What you can see here is uh, in blue is the expected number just by randomly distributing according to the nucleotide content. And in red is where the ClinVar mutations actually do reside. And what you can see is that there are two locations where there's more than you'd expect and one where there's fewer than you expect. One is very obvious. So the figure on the left here is for um, those right at the splice site itself. So we know that if you disrupt the splice site itself, so that's one or two nucleotides either side of the splice site. If you disrupt that, that has an effect. That's not surprising. That's been well described. And we expect about 3% of mutations to be like that by chance and about 5% are. The biggest surprise is if we now look towards about 70 base pairs away where ESEs function. Um, what we see is we expect about 64% to uh, be caused of disease if disease mutations are randomly distributed, but over three quarters actually are. Conversely, the exon cause, you very, you don't very often actually get a mutation in the exon central domain uh, that causes a disease. Uh, they're, they're as involved in proteins as anything else, but about a half of what you'd expect is actually in the core. So from this, we can come up with an estimate, which is about 24%. I won't take you through the details. This is the conservative estimate, which is about 24% of all mutations, we think, uh, from this, this excess that actually cause disease, not by disrupting the, oh, I've got the wrong amino acid, but instead they do it because they've changed the splicing. And this then accords with a good number of fairly recent experimental studies. So in experimental studies, you can take an exon, change the synonymous sites, and you can ask what proportion of these changes actually cause a change to the splicing of that exon in a mini gene construct. And as you can see, these numbers run from anywhere from about 20% up to about 100%. So we have some exons where every change to the exon will disrupt the splicing. They tend to be small exons, as you might imagine, with very high ESE density. Um, as, as it happens, it also uh, explains, we think, about 
uh, I think our estimate was about 30% of nonsense mutations uh, also uh, cause disease, not by being nonsense mutations, but by actually causing missplicing. Nonsense mutations are very interesting ones because they're, um, uh, as you know, these ESEs are very purine rich. Stop codons are purine rich, but ESEs can't contain stop codons in at least one frame. So it turns out that ESEs are really prone to mutating two stops, that the stop can't function as an ESE, it breaks, they break ESEs. And so we had some experimental demonstration and uh, estimates that indeed most nonsense, a third of nonsense mutations are actually having their effects by disrupting splicing. We could also go one further and look at, okay, can we now classify, and this is then getting interesting to the diagnostic end of things, uh, can we understand which exons might be more vulnerable to these splice defects than others? And it turns out it's those with few ESEs. So if you, if you have a property of an exon with relatively few ESEs, you've got less resilience to mutations that disrupt the ESE. So they tend to be those flanked by small introns because small introns are associated with few ESEs. They tend to be at the three prime end of genes, uh, but not CDS. They tend to be associated with certain splice sites and generally they uh, are associated with uh, uh, low ESE density. So we think we've got a sort of rough ballpark for saying which genes, which exons are particularly vulnerable and they're the ones that don't have many ESEs to support their splicing. So what I want to go now is what, what we're doing with this sort of information. So one of the things that we're doing with this information is to ask the question, can we come up using AI and machine learning with um, a decent uh, uh, algorithm to say this SNP or this mutation seen in parent offspring trios uh, is or is not likely to cause uh, a genetic disease. And if it is likely to cause a genetic disease, by what mechanism is it likely to cause a genetic disease? So again, don't, don't forget, so nonce mutations a few years ago never caused disease in our mind because there was no mechanism. We now know that splicing is a big mechanism. It's not the only one. There are some nice examples where both gain and loss of microRNA pairing sites, for example, uh, are so associated with disease. M6A modifications on the RNA are associated with disease and RNA stability likewise. I don't particularly want it. This is still work in progress and I'm still highly suspicious of our results. Um, uh, but we've got quite good accuracy. So the area under the curve is 92%, which is better than uh, most people can manage. But it turns out that actually there's a, just a few simple predictors of whether a mutation at a synonymous site will cause disease. And it is that the, and this is interesting in the evolutionary context, first, they are nearly always highly evolutionarily conserved. So if you look at the sites down, uh, at least the primate phylogeny, they tend to be conserved. The gene tends to be highly expressed and the AI prediction of the effects on splicing are quite high. So it looks as though highly expressed exons um, with synonymous sites that are conserved um, that if you disrupt them cause splice defects are top candidates for disease causing mutations. So we're scanning the complete human genome now to identify exons and storm sites in exons that we predict will be causative of certain diseases. But the thing I'm particularly excited about at the moment, I think, is can we now take this information and make better transgenes? Now to explain this, um, you need to know that one of the main challenges for gene therapy is that genes are not cooperative entities. Our genes are massive on the whole, and they're massive because most of the sequence is intron. And we can't handle experimentally or, or uh, in clinic um, a construct with a really, really large bunch of introns just because they're too big. I mean, most of our genes are massive. So what do we do? Well, you, the obvious solution is you get rid of the introns and you make an intronless transcript. Yep, and you preserve the 18% that is useful. Great idea. It's the only way to go really for long genes, for, for those where the CDS is long. You re we really can't handle the, the introns at all. But here's the problem. Uh, people gave up on it. And the reason you give up on it, if you do this, you have an enigmatically interesting problem, which is that when you get rid of the introns and you make an insert, you put it into our genome, it doesn't get expressed. So it looks like a perfect solution. You just get rid of the introns, uh, but they don't get expressed. And so for many years, people thought, okay, this is, we're gonna have to do some, something else here because they're not working. So what we did was uh, take an evolutionary view and say, okay, uh, from what we know about the evolution of synonymous sites, 
Can we do something slightly more intelligent than simply give up? Um, can we work out if there are synonymous sites that enable uh, this expression? So, for example, could we rationally design in or design out exonic splice enhancers? If you got rid of the exons, introns, for example, do you necessarily need all those exonic splice enhancers? And could we actually increase the stability of the RNA by getting rid of some ESEs? Because remember, they're very A rich. Get rid of them, we could put in Cs, and therefore we could increase the stability of the RNA. Or even better, it occurred to us that nature and evolution has done this experiment for us already. And that is to say, we have a large number of genes in our genome that are actually already intronless. And they are derived from genes that weren't intronless. These are our retro genes. So can we actually learn from the patterns of evolution of native intronless genes, particularly those derived as retro genes, by comparing them to the parents, to work out what did a native intronless gene actually do to solve the problem that we now face. If they've just evolved and can express successfully by going from having introns to not having introns, they have solved the problem for us. So what do they do? So we thought, okay, easy problem. We will just get a database, uh, establish a database of genes that have gone from having introns to not having introns and asking what are their properties. Uh, and it turns out there's one very obvious one. And it is they increase their GC content, particularly at the front ends of the genes, at the five prime ends of the genes. So what you see here is the GC content at the fourfold degenerate sites. So those were like glycine, you can have any one of the four at the third synonymous site. And what you see is that if you've got a count of exon, which is only one, you are heavily right skewed uh, towards this end. Um, more generally, all of our genes have this same property. And why the single exon ones are like this is the first exon is GC rich. So again, we're seeing GC4 here. So what is, the, what is the synonymous site content at the front end of genes by their exon rank? And the first exons are highly GC rich. Um, so then we had a look at, so obvious su suggestion, when a gene evolves from being, um, having lots of introns to having no introns, so retrogenes, have they evolved an increase in their GC content? And this is exactly what you see here. And the answer is yes, they do. So when you lose an intron to enable expression, you increase the GC content. Now, very good question as to what's going on. Why is that working? What is GC doing? Uh, and I'll address that in a little bit. But first, let me show you that we can do this experimentally. So what you see here is data that we generated for GFP. So GFP, gene green fluorescent protein. And if you take a GFP and you have just 80 rich third sites in GFP, put it into a human cell line, which is what we have here, it doesn't express. This is the problem that we had before. It simply will not express. Um, however, if we tweak the third site so that they're GC rich, then they express very nicely. Exactly the same protein, exactly the same promoter, exactly the same construct. The only thing that's different is we are now copying what retro genes did when they evolved from intron bearing genes and we just increase the GNC content. So what's the mechanism for this? Well, the mechanism for this we've now worked out and it turns out that within the human genome, um, we have got a big problem. And our problem is we've got too many rubbish transcripts. So we've got transposable elements being transcribed all over the place, retroviruses being expressed. If you just take a bit of DNA and randomly insert it, it gets spuriously expressed all over the place. Um, so we've got, and we've got rubbish splice forms as well. And it turns out that we've built into the way that we handle transcripts, filters to say, are you mine or are you not mine? And we're using persistently the GC content, particularly the GC content at the third sites to say, are you mine or are you not mine? Because the mutation bias is all GC to AT bias. So if you were not, if you're just neutrally evolving, you'd be AT rich. If you're GC rich, it means you must be doing something useful. And it turns out in this case that we have two, two export channels out of the nucleus. And the export channels, if you think about them, are just the place that you would put a quality control filter. So we're making lots of transcripts in the nucleus, but we're only letting out those that we go, no, you're okay. So effectively what is happening is transports, uh, transcripts are presenting a passport to the nuclear export channels. And the nuclear export channels are going, do you look like one of me or do you not? And if you don't, you're not going through. And we now know that in fact, there are two nuclear export channels. 
One is devoted to intronless transcripts and it checks, are you GC rich? The other is devoted to intron bearing transcripts and go, do you look like an intron bearing? Are you GC rich at the front end? And if you pass those two, so your, the, these two passport controls allow you through. The best analogy I can think of is if you are an American flying into the UK, you have to go through one passport channel where we'll look at you and we'll really stare you out and make sure your passport's all right. We'll really check you over because you look like a foreign foreigner. And if you, we let you through your stamp and you can go through. Conversely, when you go back to America, you go through a channel for the natives, for the Americans. They take one look at your passport and go, you're fine, straight through. That's what our, new, our two nuclear export channels are doing. One is for the residents that obviously look like residents, you know, straight through. The other looks as is for the internless ones are going, oh, are you okay? Um, and if you're GC, which you go, okay, no, I believe you, you're okay, you can pass through. But it's, it's getting through passport control. And so what you see here is the extent to which the GC rich and the GC poor transcripts are held within the cytoplasm and not exported. And what we're finding is the GC poor ones are made, but they're held in the, nu in the nucleus and they're not exported. And a, a way to get around this partially is it turns out is you can just put in a little intron five prime of the transcript and a five prime trans intron goes, oh no, you're probably mine. Uh, Non-native transcripts do not have introns near the ATG. All human intron bearing genes have one intron at least near the ATG, that start site. And we're using that to say, okay, you're one of me. So it's not a random supply site. No, it has to be right close to the ATG. So we can rescue an 80 rich one by putting in that in, and we can rescue an 81 that can't express without an intron just by putting in uh, high GC content. So that was uh, this paper that I thought might be useful to ask about. And so we've then moved this into, uh, uh, a domain where we can now design a transgene using these evolutionary learned principles and go, okay, you give me any size gene you want, I can now engineer you a gene that I'll be pretty damn confident you can insert it, and so long as it gets expressed, we'll get exported and we'll get translated. And we compared this uh, approach to uh, the commercially available quotes optimized transgenes and ours do better. Big tip for me, thank you very much, Pat on back. Um, so in summary, um, what I hope to have shown is this is a sort of slightly different use of uh, evolution and that understanding the causes of selection on synonymous sites where we thought they didn't exist at all uh, has allowed us to predict the synonymous mutations that will cause genetic diseases. And we hope in the future then to apply this to parent offspring trios in the context of rare diseases, sequence mom, sequence dad, sequence kid, you'll have about a hundred new mutations somewhere in there. And our tool will allow you to then filter through those and go, that's not as one there, that's likely to be causative and it'll do it by, and it'll suggest the hypothesis by how, how it's doing it. Um, and also then we've got this better design of transgenes for gene therapy. And what we're now moving towards is taking exactly the same insights, but not from humans, but to understand how bacterial fry ends work. So it turns out if you take a human gene with a GC rich front end and put it into a bacteria, it doesn't work. They have a completely different set of rules. And so we're, do, we're working out what their set of rules are to work out how you might really take something like insulin, take a transgene for it, put it into bacteria and have it very effectively expressed. Uh, and it turns out they invert the rules. They actually need 80 rich five prime ends, particularly A rich to destabilize the front end of the RNA. Um, and without uh, more ado, I should just simply say thank you to all my uh, unbelievably talented graduate students and postdocs who did all the hard work. I just get to talk to interesting folk and go to nice places. So uh, thank you ever so much for your time. Great, thank you, Lawrence. That was fascinating. Really, really nice talk. Thank you so much. Okay, we have uh, one question in the chat. Uh, we'd also love to hear from people directly. Uh, Neil, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question and uh, that'll allow other people to raise their hands virtually and uh, get in the queue to ask some questions. Sure, so uh, one question is whether these ESEs and intron sizes have any effects at the DNA level in terms of frequency location or other chromosomal uh, modifications, deletes, that sort of thing? I've never seen any evidence for that. Uh, but then by equal measure, I've not seen a lot of good evidence for where translocations happen. These fragile sites like Fragile Lab, for example, 
there's no obvious relationship with uh, ESEs for, uh, for those. It's, it's an interesting question because we know they do. Um, so, uh, so another property that I didn't talk about is that when ESEs are heavily enriched at the, the ends of exons, um, they tend to cause uh, unstable protein structures. So not at the DNA level, but at the, at the protein level, they tend to be disorganized structures. So what we think is going on is you're sort of trading off get being properly spliced um, with having a, a well-functioning bit of the protein. So a little bit of disordered protein is absolutely fine, as long as you're well spliced. Um, but I haven't seen anything to, to do with uh, at DNA level themselves. I can't see any obvious reason why they would do. They're not particularly repetitive. Okay. And then, um, you know, I, I don't know if you have thought about this or you're interested in it, but it would seem to me that uh, if you include non uh, include synonymous mutations with other non coding mutations, there are certainly other ways that non coding changes can influence phenotypes like transcription factor binding and perhaps less. Yeah, so, so yeah, we've had, uh, had a look at that. So, we uh, so there, there is we found evidence that um, there, there are lots of ribosomal, um, sorry, RNA binding sites within RNAs and binding proteins. The SR proteins are one class and they need to be in a certain place. Transcription factors onto the DNA level are another class. They don't bind the RNA, obviously they bind uh, DNA. Um, but we had a look to see if, for example, uh, we could find evidence of uh, avoidance of transcription factor binding sites or unwanted ribosomal, um, uh, not ribosome, RNA binding sites uh, within genes. And yes, we could. So. Uh, proteins that bind within introns exclusively, their motifs are avoided in exons. And likewise, transcription factor binding sites are uh, avoided within uh, exons as well. So it's not the only constraint on the synonymous site. There's a, sort of a whole plethora of those. Right. Where we see a difference, though, is in a sort of order of magnitude effect. The Transcription factor binding site avoidance seems to be much weaker selection than nice. the extra protein uh, preference or avoidance. And then the other mechanisms that occurred to me that could could be operating, I don't know if there's any evidence or if it's, it, it may be the same situation where it's less significant is um, phenomena like um, translational skipping, which- Yeah, so, yeah, so we've been looking at whether there's evidence for avoidance of, uh, there, there are, there are motifs that are known to promote frame shifting. Yeah. Uh, we've been looking for evidence of that, not in humans. We found some limited stuff in bacteria, but uh, okay. not in humans. Um, likewise, we've been looking to see if there's selection for out of frame stop codons. Right. Uh, to capture a frame shift. Yeah, we couldn't find any evidence for How about uh, RNA editing? Of out of frames. RNA editing. Um, I I've thought about it, but we haven't found what we think is a reliable data set of RNA editing. All right, thank you. M6A, yes. Uh, M6A has certain motifs, and we found evidence of, this is unpublished, we found evidence that there is selection on synonymous sites associated with uh, the M6A motifs, and there's selection to preserve microRNA pairing sites as well. Would you, be, would you be accepting of the notion that uh, nucleic acid has, is not just genotype, but it, that it's also phenotype? In other That's exactly how I treat it. Yeah. Thank you. I, I consider what I'm doing is sort of understanding the evolution of the anatomy of the genome. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very interesting conversation. Uh, other questions? If you can't figure out the raise your hand, just go ahead and shout them out. Shout out a question if you'd like. Oh, while people are thinking, there was a comment about non-coding as well. So we had a look in non-coding RNAs as well, link RNAs. And it turns out there is selection in link RNAs as well. And it's nearly all to preserve ESEs. Huh. So it's actually uh -huh. preserving the, main, the, the process by which the mature link RNA is made rather than what the link RNA does. And there's now some nice evidence that the splicing process is co-coupled with chromatin modification. 
And so the attraction of the SR protein binding, uh, it turns out is a mechanism to keep the chromatin open, which then regulates the downstream genes. Great. I had a kind of more general question. Um, you mentioned that humans have small exons relative to the size of the genes. Is yeah. that humans or mammals in general? Is that really something that's unique yeah. to humans? It, okay, so the number of exons per transcript is almost fixed across the vertebrates. There's very, very little intron gain or intron loss across the vertebrates. But our exons are unusually large. And that's probably because our effective... So the best predictor of the size of uh, introns is the effective population size, as you'd expect from the nearly neutral model. So the nearly neutral model says, you know, the population size gets small, selection is a weak force. So when you get an insert, you, there's not a lot you can do about it. Um, and so what we find is across the mammals, the best predictor of intron size is estimates of effective population size. And because ours ancestrally is pretty tiny, what we have is the same number of exons as all other vertebrates, but the introns are large. And so the intron, so the exon size to CDS body ratio is particularly low, not because the exons themselves are smaller, but they're smaller in proportion to the size of the intron or the size of the gene body as a whole. And you said the number of exons is, is pretty constant. Across the vertebrates, yeah, the number of exons is, is you know, you can count at almost the fingers of a highly amputated hand, the number of bona fide cases of introns gained and lost. There's, a, there's an intron gain rather interestingly in SRY, the, the Y-link gene in the marsupials. Uh, our version of SRY is a most interesting gene because it's on the Y chromosome, it's single exon, and everything else on the Y chromosome is very AT rich, uh, but not SRY, it's GC rich, which it has to be to get out of the nucleus. Okay, other questions or comments or thoughts or future directions? <laughs> A uh, question about penetrance of disease associated. No, I haven't. Um, is there a good data set about where I can get penetrance from? I have no idea. <laughs> no. But, you know, an awful lot of mutations, which are viewed as, quote, disease associated, you know, it turns out it's not as straightforward as that. And, you know, yeah. they only show up in certain people who have the mutation. And... Uh, Oh, yeah. No, in that, in that context, yes, we do know something because there are individuals who've got mutations in the SR proteins and they are particularly vulnerable to uh, mutations that in other people would not cause splicing right. defects, yeah. but in them they do cause splicing defects. It, it, it sort of reminds me of the uh, issue of how you label uh, effects as whether they're genetic or epigenetic, when in fact it's, it can be very hard to disentangle the two because you can get mutations in the genes that encode the covalent modifying enzymes. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I think the, the language around epigenetics is very sloppy like that. I agree with yeah. you. So, so the, um, the, this tendency to want to have simple, rigid categories for everything Often yeah, no, I always consider myself as somebody who just describes the mechanisms and somebody else can categorize them. Right. <laughs> so the rigid boundaries get in the way sometimes. Yeah, I, I don't find them very helpful. I find, if anything, something like epigenetics, I usually tear my hair out, hence the lack of hair, um, uh, because uh, I find that no two people are speaking about the same thing usually. It's funny you say that because I once was uh, on a cancer center seminar and someone started off talking about epigenetics and I asked them to define the term as they're using it and they couldn't. They hadn't really thought about it. No, I mean, the classic one would be uh, imprinting, for example. So imprinting is often regarded as an epigenetic condition. But of course, there are hard coded um, in the DNA properties of proteins that modify uh, the genes to whether they're methylated, not methylated, acetylated or not acetylated. Right. So, so you can say it's imprinted because it's got a load of methyls on one, one chromosome, but not the other. But how it got there was not epigenetic. Yeah. Okay. We're almost at the top of the hour. We could fit in one more question if anybody has it or one more comment. Any thoughts from anyone in the 
in the audience. Okay. Maybe I bamboozled everybody. We don't. If we don't have any more uh, questions or comments, we'll close here. Lawrence, thank you very much. I learned a tremendous amount. It's really fascinating. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, stay tuned for uh, the schedule of upcoming talks. We're having a discussion with the the organizing committee about whether to hold more of these in the summer or just wait till the fall. Uh, we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to weigh in on that. Um, you know, let us know. We're always happy to organize these and to, you know, hear from you guys. And if okay. Marco's there, hi Marco, nice to, Marco <laughs> and I have never met, but we read each each other's papers all the time. So uh, uh, <laughs> he's a braver man than I am as well, because he now does cancer and I've never been brave uh, enough to go. I wrote yeah. one paper on cancer, then beat a very hasty retreat. So uh, we have to talk. <laughs> 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 no you're not going to convince me you really are um anyway thank you ever so much for the time very nice to talk Absolutely. to you all. thank you lawrence thanks for joining thanks everybody